Every movement you perform actually starts at the feet, which makes it so weird that the foot is so forgotten, right? I mean, we, we train like back day, we train chest day, we train leg day, but people just stick their, their feet in, in a pair of shoes and, and uh, forget about them. If you have someone who's 90 who has spent their whole lives in tight shoes, no wonder their, their balance will be off when they're 90, right? Obviously, like the, <laughs> the big companies will know what's best for my feet. Of course, right? It's these huge billion dollar brands that why, why wouldn't they make the best possible shoe? Well, welcome, Melka Svart. <laughs> I'm super excited to have you today as a guest on the Ridiculously Human podcast, but I hope I got at least 50% of the pronunciation there right. <laughs> yeah, you, you get a good score. I'm very happy to be here. Oh, uh, cool. Thanks a lot, buddy. So, um, yeah, man, you're in a beautiful city at the moment, Gothenburg. I've actually been there quite a few times and had a, a lot of a lot of good times, actually. Um, mostly drunken times back in the day when I used to drink, but um, but yeah, definitely good memories. And and now that summer's coming up, it's uh, it's quite a delightful city to to be in, isn't it? It's it's quite interesting how the whole energy in the city will shift as soon as the the spring and summer comes around. You know, in in the in the winter months, it's very quiet, not a lot of people outside, a lot of people outside, but then. As soon as you know, we get these first rays of sun. It's uh, the, the parks are packed and everybody's out tanning. So uh, I, I, yeah, I love it. I, I, I'm I'm like that myself too. I mean, I during the winter months, I'm I'm a lot like indoors, but trying to you know do my like biohacks with red light and stuff. But then now I'm just out soaking the sun as much as humanly possible. Yeah, man, it's so crazy. Like I've heard you know statistics on Sweden that you have very high sort of suicide rates because of the long winters and stuff and it's for me it's almost like so difficult to believe that because i mean i've met a lot of swedes in my life and they always seem to be super happy and, and cheerful but uh, but i mean the, the stats don't say that at all really yeah i mean i guess it's about like who you surround yourself with because i haven't seen it myself either but i am aware of of that and the high depression rates as well during the winter so uh, it's definitely a thing i just i i don't see it much i don't i don't feel it at all myself either i, I kind of like to to view view it kind of seasonally you know you, you can do different things during the diff different times of the year so um, it's, it's not really a problem for me of course i love the summer more but i i also think you appreciate the summer more when you do have the the long dark winter because then it doesn't become something that you just get take for granted every day yeah when i lived in london for about like 19 years and, I, and i'm from south africa right so it took a while to get used to the the terrible weather there and uh, I, I just know like i'm a i'm a summer person i'm I'm definitely super happy um or happier when when it's uh when it's sunny um but yeah you, you actually you almost have to train yourself to not get sort of too impacted by the weather because otherwise it can be quite a depressing lifestyle especially in certain parts of europe yeah for sure but i but i also liked it to view it that the different parts of the year are for different things as well right i mean for example in the in the winter i will be you know uh you using the cold using the sauna more to, to get that that stimulus of, of my body and then in the summer i'm i'm almost never in the sauna maybe a couple of times like by the water with my family or something but uh but then other than that just you know soaking as much sun as possible and then because it's kind of interesting as well right if you think about it uh physiologically how you know, you you pick up so much more UV rays and vitamin D in the summer, so that you get more tanned, and then you have to get more pale in the winter, so that you can actually absorb some of the the vitamin D, right? So, yeah, I, I uh, past like two years, I've started to more embrace and appreciate the the seasonality. Um, so, uh, you don't because you don't have much choice, right? Anyway, it, unless you want to move, which I don't at this time, at least. Maybe I will in the future, but for now, that's that's my mentality to stay sane <laughs> and do you find it like easier to stay motivated to work when it's colder as opposed to when it's like hot in summer yeah no 100 percent, 100 percent. but i also think i think of it more pretty similarly there because i do view summer as more time to be creative as well and then the maybe fall winter early spring months as like big execution time because I mean, I love, for example, in the summers to sit outside a lot and I bring a notebook or I bring like my, uh, my notepad and I 
and I, you know, I can plan out something, a strategy and just sit with my notebook, which is super valuable as well. But I, it doesn't come as naturally to do during the winter. And then I, I really just focus on working longer hours and, and stuff. And then in the summer, I'll also take, I'm huge on taking walks, right? Because that's when I get most creative. So I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll see that as part of work to go out and walk for two hours and, uh, you know, get sun, get more ideas, go home, execute on them. So it's, it's, it's a cycle for sure. But, uh, but it's a little different, I guess, for, for people who live in warm climates all year to, to relate to it, but it works for me. I was reading something the other day about walking and that there's actually something physiologically that happens inside us, which, uh, helps to generate like thoughts and creativity. And I mean, exactly what you said there, you, you come up with good ideas and stuff. And I always find if I go for a run, like I, I, I think I have about a hundred million new ideas and I can change the world and then I always forget them. But, um, but yeah, definitely it's good for, it's good for, um, processing thoughts and coming up with new ideas yeah i think it has something to do with that the brain is like relaxing and getting that uh, opportunity to actually uh, process things and and be creative because it's the same thing with like people always say they get ideas when walking when showering when doing like these mundane things right where you're not you don't go in there to think necessarily you're just focusing on something different and then just the ideas just come and I, I, yeah, I mean, I honestly, I had the idea for why during a walk. So it's, it's like, <laughs> it's very valuable for sure. I mean, you can come up with, with great things, uh, just by taking, just by taking a walk, which is pretty, pretty cool. Yeah. It's super cool. So actually talking about walking, I, I've got a, a choice for you, right? So, uh, if you have to walk barefoot, uh, live by the sea or only drink raw milk for the rest of your life which one of those are you going to be choosing so i would uh, i would walk barefoot by the beach for sure yeah i can live without the other stuff but i i think it's uh it, it, for me the reason why i think it's so important if we if we want to go down the path right now it's that i really view the body as like any type of building structure you know like the same thing as a house or the same thing as a um, as a tree you know a, a house has a foundation uh, a tree has a, has roots and as i mean i used to work in real estate so i, I have a pretty good f- idea of like what the the building construction p- um, the phase of that is and you spend so much time building the the foundation it takes you know you can you can see this when you walk by looking um, at a construction site they'll spend so much time laying the ground everything is perfect and then the house can like pop up very fast actually um and you're like whoa what happened there uh, and same same thing with a tree i mean people don't realize but <laughs> the roots are so complex under under the ground that makes uh for um, the tree to be healthy i view the body very similarly i mean we need to have healthy roots to be able to have healthy um, arms or uh, whatever function in the body at all really uh, so when you start looking at it from that perspective it becomes a, one of the most if not the most important aspect of of uh, human physiology uh, when it comes to movement and stuff of course uh, yeah but but as i said i mean everything everything every movement you perform actually starts at the feet uh, which which makes it so weird that the foot is so forgotten right i mean we we train like back day we train chest day we train leg day but people just stick their their feet in in a pair of shoes and and uh forget about them you know because we, we can't really see them they're down there they're far away um but it's it's quite quite unbelievable how how important they are yet yet so forgotten from my perspective yeah no i 100 percent agree but i i mean i think i spend 95 percent of my life barefoot and uh yeah it's uh it's so it's so like important for you you know even just that connection with nature like you know people are just they have this soul of their shoe in you know like that disconnects us and um i was also reading the other day about like one of the most important times or not one of the most beneficial times to go out in nature uh, barefoot is after a lightning storm because apparently like the the energy you know of the ground is is like the best time to sort of absorb that I thought that was a pretty cool thing. Yeah, and it's the same thing with uh, with uh, grounding, right? I mean, it, you get the most grounding benefits when it has, like, after it has rained. Right? It's a little bit damp on, on the ground because I guess it has to do with electrical conductivity, right? 
Um, I'm, I'm not the biggest grounding expert out there, but I, I'm de I definitely know some basics and I uh, think it's super, super interesting. But I agree with you. I mean, natural movement is, um, it's, uh, it's so important yet so forgotten. And it's almost like we've <laughs> forgotten what it's like to, to be and move like a human these days, which is, is nuts, really. I mean, people will even take like the a drive through ATM these days, which is like, it's, uh, it's quite nuts. You can, you can literally leave your house and not leave your car and then come back home and you've run several errands, which is unbelievable, especially if you're, in, if you're in the US, I guess. Yeah. I mean, it's, it says a lot about society now. You just have to look at, I guess, how unhealthy people are and they're always kind of looking for the easy option. And yeah, I'm, I'm always, I kind of think of it like this. I'm like, one day, you know, when I'm older, I'm not, I'm not going to be able to walk those stairs. Or I'm, I'm not going to be able to actually walk, maybe, you know. Um, so I'm going to do it now. Like, because I know that future Gareth, one day, he'll be wishing that he took the stairs more often. But I don't think, like, people think about that enough. Yeah, I mean, I, that, that's interesting you say, because that's what I, I think about all the time. It's, <clears throat> excuse me, it's like, if I want to be able to take the stairs when I'm 90, I need to be able to take the stairs or I need to take the stairs every day when I'm 20, 30, 40, 50, whatever. Um, I, I, I strongly believe that if you never stop using your, your, uh, your limbs or whatever, your movement, then uh, you have a much higher chance of, of not losing them, which sadly, I mean, a lot of people do. And same thing there, like if we come back to the feet in, in that discussion, it's like if you have someone who's 90 who has spent their whole lives in tight shoes no wonder their their balance will be off when they're 90 right i mean if if you have deformed your feet that much over time and done nothing about it it's it's inevitable really and then we, we look at like uh, causes of death for the eld elderly and it's you know fall risk is one of the highest um, highest causes there and um, fall risk is tied to balance and balance is tied to foot health so it, it's quite sad actually yeah absolutely um i i look we, we've got a ton to talk about the uh, the feet and, and and shoes and stuff um and and I'll, I'll get there in a second for sure uh so no no, no, no i won't please, get ahead please. of myself <laughs> nobody please please I, I love it man i'm but but I, but you have such interesting you know other things and perspectives and stuff as well so you uh you recently wrote something uh in february about you know you said you can only eat five foods for the rest of your life like what do you choose and why and like so if i have to switch that back onto you like what what foods do you think are are su super beneficial and helpful for yourself yeah i mean i i think that question evolves and i and if you ask me five months in a row i might get give five different answers uh if you would ask me today because it will change with the seasons as well for me um so now we're getting into summer so now i would probably choose something like um Probably like a grass-fed steak, probably some uh, wild blueberries, uh, some uh, some raw honey, uh, maybe some um, some eggs and some, uh, some raw cheese, something like that. I think uh, now that we're going into summer, that would be mine. What would be yours? Well, I'm definitely coming over for um, for food, but that's for sure. So uh, yeah, I guess mine would be uh, definitely steak for sure. Like, I mean. I just like, I'm living in Brazil at the moment and the, the steak and, and the meat here is just, steak. it's phenomenal, but I mean, and it's like from a price perspective, I mean, it's, it's just in, really, truly incredible. Uh, so that's going to be high up on my list. Uh, I, I absolutely love like uh, the fruit here as well. So, I mean, you give me a juicy papaya or um, the avos here are just like amazing. Uh, as well as uh, the um, watermelon, pineapples. They have they're just like everything kind of like tropical just grows so nicely here. And you, you, I mean, it's insane what you pick it up for as well. But I mean, like we will drive, there's guys that on the side of the roads here that uh, they sell stuff out of the, the back of like vans and stuff. I mean, you can like in watermelon season, you can buy these monsters for like 20 reales, which is, and, and they probably weigh like 20 kgs, you know, and that's like, four dollars um and then you can buy like uh six pineapples for the same price you know and it's like and they're also like big juicy beautiful things um so it's gonna have to be yeah the the meat 
fruit. Um, and yeah, I don't know, I guess like a, a nice, like eggs, I just like nice sort of, uh, free range eggs as well. And, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of, that's maybe my, my list of three that I could, could think of right now. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a good list. I'll, I'll be coming over as well for some, uh, from, for some churrasco yeah, in Brazil yeah. for sure. Oh, cool, man. Cool, man. So listen, you seem like a super optimistic dude and guy you know like the way you sort of view the world and you view the future which is also not necessarily common these days i was wondering is that kind of always how you've viewed things has it always been your outlook uh, i've always been a positive guy i um i i have a very hard time to to be around people that are negative in general i i find that to be very draining uh, energy wise and i I, at the end of the day, my, my whole mindset is that we have, we have something today, we have something in the past, and we have a future. And the future, even though you can't control everything, you can have more impact than you think, especially as a, as a population. So if you know, a lot of people are inspiring to small amounts, that will lead to something better. And I, I, I always like to, to, uh, con- to focus on what I can control myself. And I can only control of you know doing the the least i can in, in in inspiring even though it's on a small scale and you never know uh where where it reaches and a lot of people doing the same so there's no, really no point in walking around being uh doom and gloomer about the future and uh worry about things all the time i um i i do believe that future will will arrive and and we will create it and we'll create it uh do something uh, better than today that's that's the whole mindset yeah, for sure. I mean, it, I'm I'm the exact same as you, and I, I do struggle to like understand why, like why would somebody look at the world in a like a negative way or their own life or be like super judgmental about other people, like, and and just like everything, like it's almost like this huge sense of victimhood, and I, I don't know what I don't know. Like, I just I'm like, why? Why? Like, why do you think like that? You know, and and I don't know if you've ever if you've thought about this much yourself. Like, why would someone be like that? Um, is it just because to guys like you and me, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. I mean, I think it's a it's um. I mean, we we both of us we make a lot of conscious decisions about what we eat, how we move, what we consume, how we live our lives, right? But I mean, a lot of people will they will do very average things, right? They will consume uh, media news. You know the whole twenty-four hour cycle. They will eat badly. They will not move. They will probably sit in a in a job they hate. I mean, if you compound all of these things, I think it's probably difficult at the end of the day to be very optimistic about things. Uh, and it's easy to be depressed at all the all the the news happening around the world. And because I I truly believe that we're not as as a species designed to know everything that's happening around the world all the time. Um, you know, we're not supposed to be able to know what's happening 5,000 miles away in a small town there. I mean, sure, it's, it can be super sad and it can be, it can be uh, detrimental for that town, but it doesn't really impact you that much. Uh, so maybe you shouldn't spend that much time thinking about it either. Um, and then maybe focus on all your energy or most of your energy into fixing where, where you are. Um, so even though I have great sympathy for what happens around the world because I'm, I'm, an, I'm an empathetic person, but I, I cannot spend 90% of my brain with uh, thinking about how I can fix other parts of the world when I think I should focus on fixing where I am and what I can control, really. And I think it would be health, a healthier wor- world if more people thought like that because it all comes down to like... You know, this like analogy of when people say like, okay, I'm going to have a great year. Okay. But a great year comes down to like having great months and great months comes down to having good weeks and great weeks. You're having good days. And then on an even smaller scale, you're having good hours, right? Like how do you actually spend your days? Same thing with the world. Like how, how, how do we create a fantastic world? I don't believe that's like from the top down. I believe that's from the, the, the bottom up. So if we create millions and millions and millions of small, wonderfully working communities, which we all as a species are, are in, in charge of and responsible for, then that will create a more beautiful world. And it, it's, it, yeah, that makes sense. It makes a hundred percent sense to me. And I think also maybe one of the things is like, people maybe don't like facing their own reality 
as well. So they don't really want to sort out their, their own issues or grief or trauma or whatever it is. And therefore like hanging on to something else that's hang, that's happening in another country or some politician that they don't like or whatever is, is kind of almost an easier way for them to deflect from the hard work that they actually need to do themselves. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's like, um, like you said, also victimhood and, and, um, and also going into that, um, sensation of not being in control of anything oh it doesn't matter what i do everything is shit anyway uh kind of thing so i think come comes back to personal accountability and um, do whatever you can to uh, to make make things better on on whatever scale that you can it doesn't have to be you don't have to become a president to make a change in the world you can do a lot of good things whether that's in your community through serving others starting a business talking about things around the coffee table at work. I mean, you never know. Small, small actions can, can create, create something big at the end of the day. Yeah, I think people have like kind of lost sight of uh, the influence that they have because they, you know, you see like maybe people with c- certain social media uh, platforms where they have like a million followers and two million and, and people are like, you know, that, that want to change the world. Uh, or influence people are comparing themselves to those guys that have huge followings. And then they're almost feeling like inferior and insecure. So they're like, Oh, well, I'm not even going to bother because who am I, you know? And I think social media has got a, almost a lot to blame with, uh, but blame for people not sort of um, pushing themselves and, and trying to make a change on, on a smaller scale. Yeah. But it's also easy to, to fall into that. I mean, there's always a bigger account there's always someone uh, selling more someone more successful someone more good looking someone more someone stronger someone you know it, it do- doesn't matter the, that's the 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 um, trap of comparing yourselves to others all the time and social media does a, does a great way of highlighting that of course but um but i uh, i i mean i i know some some very very successful social social media people and when you read them in real life it's like okay this is no no different uh, it's almost like they are, they are so at sometimes um, enjoying their their life less, right? Because they're so focused on making it look good that they're actually not very present in the moment. So it's like everything becomes about making things look good. So was that dinner really so good, or was it staged in a way that make it made it look good? And and the rest of the dinner was like horrible, bad conversations, bad vibes. Uh, like, uh, or how was that boat trip really? <laughs> so. I, I've, I mean, when I was younger too, I mean, you, you'd look at it and be like, oh, wow, that life, that life, that life. But now I'm like, you know, I'm very happy with my life right now. And I, I wouldn't want to be in that position even. Yeah. Yeah. It, it definitely is a trap for, for a lot of people. And uh, there's a great saying, I think it's a uh, comparison is the thief of joy. And that's what, that's what happens to a lot of people. You keep comparing your life to others and going, wow, their life's so amazing. And, uh, you know, you're just stealing joy away from your own life, which is really, really stupid in, in many ways. So you grew up in Brazil, or at least for, for part of your, uh, your childhood. Um, you also lived like around the world. Um, and now you're back home. I was kind of wondering, like, does it feel good to be back home? Do you feel like this is the place, um, you know, I'm with my people? Or are you still kind of like this multicultural sort of person yeah i i it's kind of a good question because i i've because of my upbringing where i lived and where i moved and stuff i almost felt like i didn't belong anywhere but i could blend in in a lot of places so i would yeah i mean when i was in brazil i was always the swedish guy and when i went back to sweden back then i was like oh the the kind of like international person who doesn't know a lot about the swedish uh, culture and then when I moved to the U.S., I was like, okay, the Swedish guy again. And then, you know, it's like, um, so I've, I've never felt very, very Swedish, even though it's like my identity. My, I'm probably like 97% uh, Swedish in terms of genetics. But, uh, but yeah, I, I've definitely felt some sort of um, uh, misplaced uh, my whole life. But, I, but I'm, I'm fine with it because it's given me a lot. Uh, is this the place to be? For now, it is. For now, it is. Uh, it's a great place to where we are with the business and to to run it from here. Uh, will I be living here in ten years? Uh, I don't know. We'll see. Uh, depends on on many factors, but um, but yeah, for for now, it's the right decision. That that's what matters. All we have is the present, right? So <laughs> uh, so it, it's all good for now. Yeah, for sure. I must say, I find like I, I left South Africa when I was 
18 and I always love going home because I feel like, I don't know, there's something about Africa. I don't know if you've ever been there, but there's a certain like vibe and energy about it, right? And, you know, you're like, okay, I feel, I feel at home, but also like, I feel like I'm with my people and, you know, you get the sort of the jokes and the ways of doing things and, and, and these sort of things. Like, does that, does it feel like that for you in Sweden? No, I see what you mean. Absolutely. But I think also with the way I grew up was, I mean, I, when I, when I, when I first started school, I have a, I had a class with, uh, I think it was 14 or 16 different nationalities. So I grew up with this like super wide spectrum of people, uh, being very comfortable in that situation, actually, you know, you know, I, one of my friend, best friends was Japan. One of other friends was from the U S. Uh, so I, um, I see that, but at the same time, one thing I've realized is that I can actually feel more home in situation in other places. Uh, like for example, I, when I lived in the U.S., I felt very much home there. Um, and um, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, I, I think it has more more of the more of the emotional connection because um, I mean, I probably have more friends um, that I talk to on a daily basis in the U.S. or other parts of the world than I do uh, here in Sweden. So. It's um, yeah, it's very connected to that as well. But it's, it, yeah, I, it's interesting though. Yeah, no, well, I mean, you definitely have an uncommon kind of like upbringing, I guess. Then and um, yeah, it makes total sense the way way you're describing it. So, uh, Malka, I um, I grew up watching uh, Boris Becker and Stefan Edberg having these amazing like battles, especially at uh, at Wimbledon, right? And uh, I, I, like Becker was my favorite, and um, I always used to like try and serve like Becker, like I thought he had such a cool style and whatnot, but um, you, you are a, like a highly accomplished tennis player yourself. I was wondering, did you have any like favorites as a, as a youngster? Yeah. So I, I used to, when I was young, when I was young, I used to like uh, kind of the crazy guys on court, uh, those who showed a lot of emotions and uh, were kind of like out there. And then as I, as I grew up, more i started appreciating the the true beauty of the game like a roger federer so he he's probably my like my, my all-time favorite in terms of like the the grace and the beauty and and the sportsmanship uh always appreciated that a lot um but yeah i mean tennis uh, tennis has has given me so much actually when you when you think about it um in many ways i think it's it's one of the the best sports to get good at not only because of like the things you get in terms of like athletic capabilities uh, and you know hand-eye coordination and all that but also in terms of uh like networking actually um i mean there's a lot of a lot of accomplished people who love to play tennis and it's kind of interesting actually i mean i i spent some summers this was many years ago uh, just coaching tennis in the u.s and uh, met some very, very uh, people, uh, like very accomplished people that, that uh, you know, I really looked up to, right? And I would be like, oh, I can't wait to ask this person like some business questions or uh, something. Uh, but the interesting thing there is when I, as soon as we step on the tennis court, that whole thing uh, shifts and they are actually interested in asking me questions now. <laughs> uh. But, you know, outside of the court, it's uh it's complete opposite so it's very very interesting to become um kind of the the teacher of someone uh where you are actually the expert and they are very um interested in what you have to say uh but uh but yeah just an interesting side note but i, I do think tennis is like yeah it's an unbelievably beautiful game in in many ways yeah yeah that's definitely have, have you ever played yeah i used to play a lot as a youngster oh, um nice I, I was lucky at, we had a tennis court at home so uh, we, uh, cool. you know, I, I used to play, you know, every week, that's for sure. But I was never like, it wasn't actually my sport though, to be honest with you. It was more like a, a side sport. I was actually a, more into water sports, swimming and water polo were, were my sports. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I actually spent a, a summer in America in a camp and, um, I, w during our lunch breaks, when the kids were sleeping, I would, uh, play tennis with the tennis guys. And uh, yeah, I was amazed at like how, how good we actually all got, like playing every single day. It was just like, yeah, like you said, it's an epic sport to, to get good at, you know, and um, there's, there's so many, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it can be very technical and um, very physical and uh, yeah, you're always trying to like fine tune something. Um, so there's a lot of like thought that goes into it, you know, I, I think it's a, it is a fantastic and I sport. Think it, yeah. And I think it teaches you a lot about life too, because you are 
I mean, when you play competitively, you are completely alone also. I mean, you it's really uh, up to you to solve problems and uh, you can't blame anyone else. But you also get to, to take credit when, it, when, it's, uh, when it's going well. So, yeah, I think, I mean, in uh, what would, I mean, I've really thought about this much, but now that I'm thinking about it out loud, it's like, I think I've probably become a better problem solver from, from um, being a tennis player because there's no one to save you. <laughs> you, you can ask people, people for help after the game, but you can't, you can't ask for help during the game. And uh, you really have to dig deep within yourself to, to find that strength or to find a solution or uh, what, whatever it might be to, to dig yourself out of a hole. And, um, and uh, yeah, I think, I think I can apply that quite, quite a lot to, to business as well. I mean, there's problems all the time and they need solutions and you can't really sit down and cry about it. You just gotta, <laughs> gotta find solutions. And, and even like it teaches you, I guess, like tenacity and grit. I, I think it was on one of your posts recently where someone was saying that, you know, you can be two sets down, five love down, 40 love and still, you know, make a comeback. And, uh, you know, it's amazing how the, uh, the flow of a game can switch. It's just like, it's, it's kind of mind blowing sometimes, you know, it's almost like, I don't know, someone flicks a switch and the person just switches off who was leading. And then <laughs> the, the other person just like makes a, this miraculous comeback. And I think it, you always feel like you're in with a chance. So maybe that's like almost a, like a mindset thing, even for life. You know, you're like, okay, cool. I'm down and out. My business is not going well, but I know there's a chance. There's a way to come back. Yeah. There's all, I mean, in tennis, like you can, you can literally be down six, zero, five, zero, 40 love down and still come out on top. It's hard, but it can be done. And in many sports, that's like it's over already because you can play down the clock you can do whatever but there's no clock in tennis and i think that comment actually that you're referring to he was kind of saying that that was a flaw in tennis and i and to me that's the absolute beauty of tennis that's that uh that there is this uh very complex co- scoring system that uh, that you <laughs> you um that is unique to any other sport really uh when you think about it and um and it's also like it's hard to say that it's a flaw because the the whole sport is like built around that mindset, right? That it is never over. I mean, it would be, it, let's say you would play tennis and you would play like, okay, first to 100 points. It would be a completely different sport. I mean, it wouldn't be tennis. It would be well, yeah, something different. So uh, the fact that, you know, the, these mental games and the fact that you can maybe, um, uh, you can throw away a set for tactical purposes when when things are going down to shift the momentum early second set and things like that uh that's really what the sport is about and um to um, yeah to play, play by the rules you have to that's what you have to do that's interesting that's interesting and also even if you think about like the scoring the scoring is quite interesting because effectively what it's like four nil like if you to win a game or whatever four threes you know to win a game sort of thing but that doesn't sound half as cool as like 40 love or, you know, 40, 15 sort of thing. Like, like if you were saying, oh no, it's uh, you know, this is currently three, one in this game, but uh, you know, 40, 15 sounds, I don't know. I mean, maybe it's just because we've normalized that, you know, it, it's interesting how they came up with the, the, the numbers for the scoring. I actually don't know how they came up with that. It's probably some interesting history behind that, but I, I have, uh, I, I've had some vague memory that someone has told me about it, but this is a long time ago, but I can't remember now. At playing tennis, you reached like a, a very high standard. I think you said you're in about number 400 in the world for junior tennis, um, which is phenomenal. Uh, did, uh, you also, it also kind of maybe in a way sort of sparked your, your current business idea because you actually had to deal with quite a lot of foot injuries. And I was wondering, were those foot injuries due to tennis or were they due to other things? So it wasn't probably injuries per se. Well, I did have one heel injury that could be uh, contributed to that. But it was more about um, uh, discomfort, I would say. And, uh, you know, pressing my feet into these these shoes during all years. I mean, I I used to think it was normal, actually, that you would just put a shoe on for for three weeks and then after three weeks you've broken it in and then it lasts you for another three weeks before it breaks and then uh, you do that cycle over and over and over again i thought that was normal because obviously like the (laughs) the big companies will know what's best for my feet 
of course, right? It's it, these huge billion dollar brands that why why wouldn't they make the best possible shoes? Uh, so it was more about discomfort. I mean, I, I always had so much discomfort. Uh, and tennis is very intense in how you move, you know, quick starts, quick stops, uh, turning all the time. Uh, so, um, I mean, I've, I've had to work a lot on restoring my feet from those, um, those years. And, and like, just like you, I, I mean, I am 95% barefoot myself as well. Uh, but then those other 5%, when I need to wear shoes, I, I wear my own, but it's, um, it's definitely a journey and it's not, not easy for everyone, but I guess besides like uh, foot stuff, you, you're also like a super health nerd, right? And, and, and I, I mean, I, I would say you're a bit of a guru uh, looking at your, your feed and, and uh, you know, the things that you write about, um, did, is that something you've always been sort of interested as a result of your, your lifestyle or did it, did something sort of initiate that? interest yeah there was when i was like 15 or something we bought a water filtration system in my house my family and i remember the first thing we did was we uh on that, on that like machine you could also choose the ph value so we chose a very low ph value and we put put it in a in a gla- glass uh and then we put some like cherry tomatoes in there and then after like 10 minutes the water was yellow and we were like, what is going on here? And then we started reading, on, reading about it. And it turns out in that acidity, the, sometimes the pesticide can come off and be released into the water. Uh, so after that day, we you know, started buying <laughs> organic foods and uh, shifting that a little bit. And then back then, I was actually very, very interested in veganism, um, which is a whole other story. Uh, but and uh, I thought I kind of thought that was the answer back then. And then, of course, I mean, I continued my tennis career, didn't even think about it. And then I moved to the U.S. for four and a half, five years. Um, and of course, food in the U.S. is very, very bad, especially like living in a college um, um, situation. Being served food four times a day uh, from like a cafeteria. Um, so I didn't I really neglected it during those years, even though I I would like do maybe small things that I would be conscious about. Like I didn't used to like microwaving popcorn and stuff like that. I would rather just make them on the stove. But I mean, in general, very unhealthy years. And then, um, and then, yeah, when I came back to Sweden after that, I actually, I did turn vegan and um, did that for, for two years. Uh, was a very bad idea for me. Um, uh, but, but yeah, I think, I mean, that's like overall, kind of where my my health journey has, has come from and i've I, I love like experimenting things i love testing new things trying it on myself see how i feel see if there's any difference um so which i think is super interesting i think that's um <clears throat> such an important piece of information is like you have to test things on yourself right like there's no better science experiment uh, or eating experiments or whatever it is than than actually doing it yourself because there's so many guys out there that are like, you know, you must eat like this and you must eat like that and whatever. And it's like, you know, fair enough. A lot of them are, you know, uh, they have other people's best interests at heart and they, they think that they know what they are um, advising on is the right thing. But actually, you really have to test it on yourself, you know, because maybe for some people, like being a vegan does work. You know, it seems like for some people it, 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 yeah. it sort of works, you know. But then for other people, there's no ways they can do it, you know, and, and you get, I think you had a thing called vitiligo or something like that as, as a result yeah. of it. Um, you know, I actually tried uh, vegetarianism for like about six months, but it just didn't feel right, you know, and, um, you, but you, but you actually have to try these things yourself, you know, rather than, uh, someone telling you what to do, you have to go, like almost in like three month sort of phases minimum to go, okay, cool. I'm going to experiment with this for three months, see how I feel. And, um, it's a great piece of information for people to, to yeah. realize. Yeah, I mean, I, I love doing those like, you know, quarterly experiments. Uh, I mean, I've tried keto. I've, I've, I've tried everything pretty much. Um, I've tried vegetarian as well. I, yeah, I think at the end of the day, for me, it's, it comes down to experimentation, but also, you know, um, because you can read all the studies in the world, but if you don't know how it directly impacts you and how you feel, it's very hard to act on it, especially long term. So, so yeah, that's. I mean, I, I'm I'm a very curious person. I like I like to to test things, but um, 
I think more and more, like you said also with people saying you have to eat like this, you have to eat like that. Uh, I mean, I'm sometimes a little bit annoyed with, with people who think it's all about diet also, right? It's like there's so many components to health that it's, you, cannot, you cannot just take diet advice and, and do, do nothing else. I mean, there's so much more like sleep, movement, sunlight. I mean, you name it, right? Grounding. I mean, there's, so, there's so much uh, to get a complete health profile. That, uh, but I understand though, diet is the, the is an easy one that people just think that they can change and, and solve everything. But fortunately, it doesn't really work that way. What do you think uh, most people get wrong about health? I think it's a uh, sedentary lifestyle, a lot of sitting, um, a lot of time indoors. Um, I think that's that's the probably the biggest one. And then, of course, I mean, diet is a huge one as well. Um, but I, I, yeah, I, I think a lot of them kind of go together for me as well, because if you think about it, like, for example, the sedentary lifestyles being a lot uh, indoors, that will make you, you know, that will make you sleep worse, probably because you're probably crushing the blue light at night and you're, you know, you're not overall not making yourself very tired for the evening. So you you probably can't sleep very well. And if you don't sleep very well, then you will have a lot of cravings that you probably shouldn't have the, the, the next day. So they, they're, they're very intertwined in a, in a way that, um, that most people don't realize. Um, and, um, and just a, such a thing as like grounding, right? I mean, some people won't, won't ground for, for months on end. They won't touch the surface of the earth for months. And uh, just looking at, you know, before and after pictures of people's blood cells when they put them under, under a microscope after just like 45 minutes of grounding, no, no wonder people don't feel that well. I mean, for example, like I, I sit here at my desk working a lot. I still have a grounding mat that I've te- tested with, a, with, a, ground, with a, a grounding device. I, so those like small conscious decisions that makes, I believe makes a huge difference over time. So yeah, but, but, I, but I, I also really respect people that everyone's on their own timeline and on their own journey. Everybody can't can't know everything uh, from the start. Neither neither have I or do I. So it's uh, I I have a lot of respect for that. It's a it's a constant uh, learning process and journey, you know. And it's uh, yeah, it's important not to judge and just understand that different people are going to wake up at at different times and and realize certain things. Um, one of the things that you you wrote about is like how people have been misled by the the sun and like how it's inherently dangerous. And I think that's like a, a huge thing for people. They, they like try and avoid the sun. Meanwhile, actually it's a, quite a healing mechanism for us. And the source of life, right? <laughs> I mean, it's like, it, yeah. I mean, when, when I see people, you know, sit indoors and spray sunscreen in their face, like all the, all day and they're sitting under these, you know, lead lights and stuff. I, I uh, yeah, it's it, it it just makes me think that something has gone very wrong with humanity, right? When we when we believe that the the one source in the sky that gives us all life on Earth is inherently dangerous, because I do believe it can be dangerous if you are either unhealthy or treating it with no respect, right? It's two different things. I don't, I'm not saying you should fly to Thailand in the middle of winter and lay in the sun for ten hours. I think that's that's a bad idea. Or, I mean, if you have a terrible diet, you probably shouldn't uh, lay outside in the sun in midday for, for hours on end either. But, I mean, when I hear things about like, oh, you have to have sunscreen 24 hours a day all year round, or there's no safe level of a tan ever, like posted in the New York Times, like, to me, that's just complete craziness and uh, disregard for, um, for what, what, I mean, the human species, I mean, if, if that was true, I mean, we wouldn't be here sitting on talking on this podcast. So uh, we would have we would have been extinct, extinct, extinct a long time ago. Yeah, you sometimes have to wonder where like those journalists just sort of suck that rubbish out of, you know, like it's like you just roll your eyes and you're like, this is, you know, they must know that it makes no sense. <laughs> and I'm like, I mean, you'd, you would think so, but I, I'm, I'm doubting it sometimes. Yeah, I know, but sometimes I'm like, Surely, you know, one day you're going to regret writing this stuff if you know that it's just for, I guess, clicks or whatever it is. Like, don't you have any conscience? Like, it just blows my mind sometimes. Yeah, me too. Me too. <laughs> so you, uh, you know, have started this amazing company called uh, Wide Footwear. And 
I mean, so my, my kind of awakening with, um, with feet and footwear and stuff was I read the book, uh, born to run. And I literally, I mean, I literally threw away my running shoes and I bought, uh, these barefoot shoes called vivos. Um, and, uh, and then I, I did like my first, uh, I ran, I was like, I was on holiday and I went and I did like a 5k run in the Vivos. I was like, oh, cool. And then for the rest of my holiday, I couldn't walk <laughs> because my calf muscles were so stiff. It was just, just insane. So if anyone is going to enter into like a bit of barefoot running, do like one kilometer maximum first, you know, <laughs> um, yeah, for sure. And then eventually like, you know, over time I, I sort of, um, strengthen my, my legs and calves and Achilles and everything. And, you know, just, I've only ever since worn barefoot shoes and, uh, like even run marathons and stuff and like Vibrams and whatnot. But, um, cool. but, uh, but yeah, you, I mean, you've got a, an amazing, uh, footwear, uh, like how, how did that idea come about for you? Yeah. So similar to you, I, um, I didn't read born to run back then, but I, I read, I listened to several podcasts and I was like, look, this must be the answer that uh, my shoes, my current shoes are bad. And I found this company, the same like you, Vivo, which uh, I think have done so much good for, for the industry. Uh, a lot of respect for them. Um, so I bought, I bought three or four of their shoes and pretty much threw all my old shoes into, the, into my storage uh, in my apartment. And I started working, uh, walking to them at, to my office and I, I was just wearing them all the time. And then I started, because I, as I mentioned previously, I love taking walks, right? So I, I used to uh, go out and take long walks, like 60, 90, 120 minutes. Um, and then after that, it didn't really feel that good, like you said. I mean, probably went at it too hard, too fast. And uh, then I started realizing that this is a, actually a problem, because a lot of people feel this way. A lot of people go from one very extreme, you know, very, very cushioned shoe, pointy toe box, stiff sole, a heel to toe drop to a very barefoot style shoe with, you know, zero drop, couple millimeters of sole, uh, very, very flexible and um, yeah, and uh, yeah, like a flexible sole. So, and that, that transition, like you, like you mentioned in um, when you went to run a 5k, like your calves were smoked right after that. And, and uh, we, that, that that's kind of where the idea came about because we felt like there was a gap where maybe you can take the best of both worlds uh, in a way where you should have that wide toe box that we have. And I think we have one of the widest, at least one of the, the widest where, uh, where we believe that the, the big toe is allowed in its correct position. Uh, but also you know, having that zero drop and having a, a flexible enough sole, because I personally and, and my 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 colleagues don't believe that the sole really needs to bend up like a ball because the foot doesn't really move that way and it can't move that way. So it, it's more important that it can bend optimally at the toes. Um, so that's kind of the direction that we're going to. But also, you know, um, also when people have for example, like you're going to a party or you're going downtown. A lot of people don't want to look weird. And we, we, we thought there was a huge gap there where there was nothing that we wanted to buy. We were like, okay, this is really, really cool. A little bit more cushioned than the, the like two, three, four, five millimeter sole, which kind of will hurt for a lot of people walking on these hard surfaces like concrete or, or asphalt. But also bringing fashion back to it, where we can like compete with the the Nike Air Forces or the Adidas Yeezys or uh, the New Balances, the, the cool sneakers, right? Um, so that's that's more the direction that we're going now. And yeah, I mean, people are people are loving it uh, really uh, because they are they are re realizing that they can wear a shoe that they think looks good but they don't have to have pain at the end of the day <laughs> and once people have that awakening then it's very hard to go to go back and that's why we see like i mean we have so many recurring customers that will buy like one pair of shoes and then a month later they'll be like okay but i can't wear anything else now so 
I have to, I guess I have to buy all the colors because like, what else am I going to do? So it's really up to us to just keep delivering uh, good stuff and, um, and uh, yeah, helping people have a, have a wide, uh, no pun intended, um, wardrobe for their shoes. It was a long answer to your question, but, uh, but yeah. No, no, not at all. Not at all. Uh, so, so maybe it's good like to, uh, you've touched on it now, but just like to, to explain a little bit more, um, what is the actual issue with like modern shoes that people really, they don't even think about? So it's, it's a couple of different things. I, I like to focus on four main ones. So the, app, the biggest problem, according to me, is the, the shape of the toe box. This is, the toe box is where your toes are in the, in the shoe. So if you look at a perfect, uh, the perfect anatomy of a foot, um, and if you look at one from, for um, a newborn baby, for example, their foot is actually the widest at the toes. And this is something that we don't really see any shoes are shaped after. And instead, when, 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 when you go buy like a shoe that says that, that it is wide, it'll be wide, but it'll be wide at the middle part of the, of the foot. And then the toe box will still be pointy. So put, placing your, your big toe and your fifth toe out of position, like towards each other, and um, and that's not really how the foot is supposed to look. It's not how the foot is supposed to move. So, and, and the thing is, like when you when you do put the the big toe out of position, you will actually have a lot of consequences up in the chain of the body. So, you can actually try this. I mean, um, if you if you're listening to this and you you stand up and you you put your your toe in a correct position, which would be a straight line from from the metatarsal, the bone. Um, and then you actually just with your finger put um, the toe towards the other toe like a lot you will see that the arch starts to collapse and what happens when the arch collapses well this the knee starts caving in right and then that will have consequences up to the hip and the lower back so just that one thing of having a, a pointy toe box will actually might give you you know lower back pain two years later or three years later and you don't and you're like oh why why do i have a lower back pain now that's one aspect of, of why shoes are, are, pro- are problematic. And then we have, you know, um, the sole, uh, the sole stiffness. A lot of soles are very, very stiff. And this is, honestly, I still have a hard time understanding why people do this. Um, but they're so not bendy. So which means that your, your toes cannot bend like they're supposed to. Uh, and that's, that's horrible for, for the walking gait cycle. So you, you're literally putting your, your toes to sleep uh, when you're walking, which is not good. And um, and then we have you know the drop, so the meaning that your your heel is higher than the forefoot. And uh, what what happens there is that you're 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 quite literally standing downhill, right? And putting a lot of pressure on on the forefoot. And what happens if you're standing downhill? It, it's quite quite obvious that the body has to to compensate, and the body will have to make itself straight again meaning that you'll have start several um what is it called um uh, compensations in the body uh, to make up for that structural uh, problem at the feet and what they also do when they when they put that heel to toe drop is they'll put something that we call a toe spring in the in the footwear industry where uh, you probably see this in shoes but that uh, they kind of angled upwards again at the toes and this is for that because they want to give you this sensation that you're rolling forward, that you kind of, kind of like walking on clouds, right? Um, but what happens then is that you're you're actually stretching the the fascia under the foot, which which means that there it's it's in a complete stretch position all day, uh, or for as, as long as you you're wearing the shoes, meaning that that puts a lot of pressure again, and your foot will never be able to relax. So. You can sometimes see that when people take their shoes off and their their foot is still in that position, and it's like, okay, yeah, you've been wearing these uh, these kinds of shoes for many years. Uh, but yeah, the, the, those those are really the the main issues, and uh, it's quite a lot. But again, then we we do we try to do all of those things kind of the, the opposite, right? To to fix that, it's almost like mind blowing, like how we've uh, had this for such a long time, you know, and it's like everybody kind of wears shoes like that and and that there hasn't been some what's it like a podiatrist they they look after feet i think hey and um 
you know, like there hasn't been someone going, oh, well, you know, maybe we should design shoes like differently. <laughs> it just, it's just crazy how every shoe company is, is kind of just gone with the flow. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, I, I, I posted a video about this the other day, but it's, you know, it comes a lot from the, the industrial revolution as well that uh, you wanted to start uh, mass producing shoes. And uh, so, so part of people don't know, but when you're making a t-shirt, for example, you just sew two pieces of fabric together and you have a t-shirt. But when you make a shoe, you have to you have to make the sole, and that has to come from a, a steel or al- aluminum mold, meaning that you have to decide what the sole shape will be. And of course, the the same thing is to make like we do. We make two different soles, and and all the companies do this today, pretty much. But back then, they just said, okay, but why don't we just use one mold and make it symmetrical, so uh, so that it would be rounded then, because you can't can't other than if you would do it another way it would have to be like like a like a box right so they just said look people won't probably won't notice let's just make one symmetrical sole for both feet but the problem is that the feet are asymmetrical the left and right are not the same so from there you just started deforming feet and that became fashion and, and lived on for like hundreds of years since then and um today it's standard but it's it's odd i mean it's it's really odd that it hasn't happened or changed earlier the, the cool thing for you is it's created this like awesome opportunity and i think we're living through this pretty cool renaissance i feel at the moment where people are actually questioning a lot of ways of living and you know uh, lifestyle and and wanting to just be healthier and go back to our roots and and these sort of things and you know like businesses like yours are i mean you have the you know, possibility that it could just explode, you know what I mean? And like, uh, because people are like, yeah, wait, well, this makes much more sense. I definitely want to have, you know, wide footwear. Like, um, so, so it's super cool for you at least. Yeah. I mean, it, it is, it is cool for me, but I mean, if I, if I could choose, I would have loved for this problem to be solved for, for when I was a kid and uh, I could do it something different. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, I, I love what I do and I, I wake up pumped every single day to, to uh, get this message out to more people. Uh, but I am also a little bit jealous of like my future son, right, or my future daughter, because they will they will be in a different position and they will they will grow up and have like a complete um, different opportunity when it comes to movement and how the hu- their human bodies will work. Uh, so they're lucky kids for sure. For sure, I feel lucky because growing up in South Africa, I mean, I've hardly ever wore shoes, but I mean, you'd even go to the the shopping mall, you know, as a youngster, like without shoes is like it's just just what you did <laughs> and now like looking back like that was a that was a super cool thing to do especially for for health and, and longevity something very interesting that you did is you did like one of the largest um health uh, sorry so health, uh, shoe sort of uh researchers um you know in or research studies in sri lanka um can you just maybe talk a little bit about that? Because I think it's pretty fascinating. Yeah, I mean, I think early on we we said that we don't want to be just another shoe brand. We don't want to just make a shoe and then try to market it and sell some and, and be happy. We said, okay, if we're going to do this, we're going to make a difference. And, and we're going to make a difference through projects. We're going to inspire people for real. We're going to make shoes that are on a completely different level to anything else that exists. And we are um, going to, to contribute to to the cause in, in every way we, that we can. Um, and then, of course, an orga- organization um, that's also based here in Gothenburg called MyFoot Function, which are a big player in the, in the foot health education uh, uh, industry. They came to us and they said that they had this idea of doing this study, and we jumped on it right away and said, okay, let's, let's do it. So we, I mean, we spent a full month in Sri Lanka um, and we studied over a thousand people, thousand seventy one, if I remember correct, correctly. And um, it wasn't probably the best thing for um, to go away for the full month of November when it co- when it comes to like Black Friday month and stuff like that. But <laughs> but uh, you know the, the the mission is more important than than that. And uh, so we were away for the full month of November, studied so many people. And we what we did was we we brought a three D scanner, so we would like put them kind of like a conveyor belt but it sounds sounds weird but you you know what i mean so we had them station one was a 3d scanner which where we can get all the angles of all the all the all the components of the foot you know width length big toe angle 
um, arch height, everything. And then on the sec second step, we would uh, study them on the something called the plantar pressure plate, where we can they'll they'll stand on it, and we will see the heat map on where the pressure goes. So what's interesting there is that people who have walked a lot of barefoot will have a more more evenly distributed um, uh, uh, heat map, and and when they move, they will have a lot of uh, heat. I mean, um, pressure on the big toe, which. If you take someone like in the Western world and stand on one of those, they will have a lot of pressure on the heels. Um, and you sometimes can't even see the pressure of the toes. It's kind of just completely disconnected. Because if you walked in these shoes like we do, um, you will, um, yeah, the foot will be formed that way. And you will, that will show when, even when you go barefoot. So it takes time to reverse, but it's definitely possible. And then we did a questionnaire and just asked them about their habits. And um, yeah, very, very interesting to see uh, the differences between the, the population wearing shoes and the population who was barefoot or the population wearing sandals as well. What was some of the most interesting things for you? Well, I think the most interesting thing was seeing how, for me personally, seeing how genetics don't seem to play much of a role when it comes to Halix Valgus and the environment plays a very, very big role. Like for example, and I and I posted about this in the in the thread that went went kind of viral, that we saw um, we met several families, and I only posted about one, but we saw this over and over and over again. Uh, that you could see, like for example, in that example that I posted, that two younger daughters uh, were had never worn shoes, and the older daughter had worn shoes and gone to school for for three or four years, and then the mother had also never worn shoes. There was only one person in that chain who's worn shoes. And she was the only one with a severe hallux valgus, which is where when the big toe is very misaligned and uh, formed after her, her shoes, which will then give functional difficulties. So that's the one thing that genetics is not a factor, at least a very small factor. You can have like genetic predispositions where, you know, maybe your bone density is one way or your, your joints are, are, are softer, which will uh, make it easier for you to develop a deformity. But rarely the cause i would say and then um and then the, uh, the other factor would be like how tied it was to occupation so for example we we visited places like a tea plantation where people would walk barefoot all the time just work for 14 hours a day uh and walk barefoot out in the in the hills and they would have so functional feet just unbelievable uh functionality they would sit in a squat easily they would have big wide healthy feet and then we we drive ten minutes to the police station, and we 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 examine them, and they're all wearing these tight shoes for like, you know, their twelve hour shifts every day, and and instantly you see all these deformities formed after their feet. So it's just those are very interesting, you know, on the, the genetic part, and then to the how bound bound it is to occupation. It's absolutely fascinating. <clears throat> Talking about shoes, I uh, I heard that. Uh, so, you know, I think it's quite fashionable for say like nurses and doctors and stuff to wear Crocs, right? Uh, and, but actually what's happening now is that they're finding that they're having like knee issues and hip issues, um, because of the, almost like the bounciness of the Croc and um, because it's not like a stable way to kind of stand, which I thought, you know, it's it sort of just makes you know what you're saying absolute um you know absolute sense and like people are just really messing up the rest of their bodies because they w they just got the wrong things on their feet exactly i mean you can see that with how how these running shoes that are exploding right now called like hookahs and, and those brands because they they want they're they're so cushioned that um that you like literally feels weird to walk in we actually bought some just to try them uh, like a month ago and see how it, how they felt when we were looking at developing uh, something like that, um, but in a good way. But uh, but yeah, it was I, I I almost couldn't even try them because it was so uncomfortable. Because I'm also used to to uh, what I'm wearing on a daily basis. But but yeah, it's unbelievable. And I and I think the interesting part about what you said there, like people will wear something and it'll feel comfortable in the beginning. But they what they don't understand is that you are you are potentially setting yourself up for an injury down the road, which 
maybe in six months, like you said, you have knee pain or you have lower back pain or, you know, something is just misaligned and you're like, oh, that's odd. I had a, had, I just got an injury. Yeah, but w- what changes did you do a year ago or six months ago that led to this? So definitely plays a huge factor. The Crocs are interesting because they, I mean, they do have like a wide toe box, I guess you would, you would say. Um, but I mean, other, other than that, I wouldn't really recommend. Yeah. I mean, definitely not from a fashion perspective, I would not recommend them uh, at all. But just talking about like, uh, sort of like how you actually stand and stuff as well. My, one of my, well, my first bodybuilding coach, uh, he, uh, like part of like our, um, you know, he was like, what injuries do you have and stuff or, or ailments? And I was like, oh, I've got like a, um, you know, quite a weak, sore lower back. And he's like, okay, cool. Let me see you stand. So like I stood for him and he's like, oh, I can see what it is. Like you, like I was a swimmer and he's like, oh, you stand with your, your legs too straight. Like you, you actually, um, you're putting pressure on your lower back because you're always standing with your legs straight. He's like, what you should do is you should just put a slight bend in your, in your knees. And um, you then, you, you just remove the pressure like from your lower back. You sort of almost add it to your hammies and to your um, butt cheeks. And, uh, it's just, it's some, it's things like that, that people are not aware of, you know, like, you know, and, and we, we, we really need to sort of try and understand these things better by, I guess, well, research, trying different things. But for me, who was even like, I thought super knowledgeable of of health and all these sort of things for him to go, no, this is, this is what you're doing. And like, ever since then, I've become like super conscious when I stand, like even now, like I'm standing, you know, I'm like, wait, mm. my legs are a bit straight. Let me just sort of bend them. And then it's just like, oh, you just feel the release in your body. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know to that specific example, but it, it, I, it, to the principle, I, it seems like we're very similar. That is, it's, interest, it's fun to learn new things and to, to expand the, the knowledge base for sure. So, but just as we sort of start finishing off, um, what, are, what were some of your, your biggest business challenges developing your own brand and own new footwear? Uh, sometimes I say that if I knew how complicated it w- would be to make a shoe, I probably wouldn't wouldn't try it again. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I, I mean, I love a good challenge, and uh, I I even though I, I mean I've been involved in in fashion startups before, like doing backpacks and stuff like that. But making shoes was complicated to another level, and uh, we've learned a lot during these three years now, and since we had the idea, so. Yeah, uh, the challenges back then was, I mean, it was co- during COVID, so couldn't really travel and see our manufacturing partners and, and stuff like that, um, which made it more difficult to do everything online. Uh, but then, you know, a, a lot of business for me is to just figure things out, really. I mean, to you, you can often, I mean, I, I'm sure I look at, you know, bigger brands than we are and think like, oh, they have everything under control. And some people will look at, at our company and think, oh, they have everything under control. But it's, it's really about solving problems on the daily. <laughs> and it's, uh, uh, everybody is guessing. Everybody is um, doing the best they can with the, the resources that they have. So, you know, we, we have problems to solve every single day. And uh, that has, has been like that for, for years. So, but it's fun. I mean, uh, as I said in the beginning with the tennis stuff and stuff, uh, and that I I'm, I like I like being a problem solver. I like to dig into issues and make things more effective, make things uh, scalable all the time. Uh, like one of my biggest passions to to be able to help more people. But yeah, challenges uh, challenges every single day. <laughs> but it's fun. And 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 like how many iterations did it take to get the the current shoe that you have? Uh, oh, the current one. So the first one we released maybe was, I can't remember exactly, but somewhere between 10 and 15 different iterations. And then for the second one, we actually learned the process a lot more. So we got better. So maybe there was like six, maybe five or six. And then for the one we're doing now, I think it will be down to two or three. So we're getting, we're getting better and better at the process, you know, because we're all constantly like moving things that okay, this works, so we'll apply that automatically to the next one. And this war- did not work, so we'll never think about that again. And uh, things like that. But uh, it, yeah, it's interesting how much better you can come back. Like now, when I think back of what we did in the beginning, it's like, whoa, we knew nothing like what we're doing. Yeah, and I think that's really the, the sort of lesson for, for so many things is like, you actually are only going to learn once you start doing something. And, 
and, and you know, and, and so for people that are, are wanting to do something, don't think about it, you know, don't read more books, don't whatever, just go and do it because by doing it and taking action, that's how you're going to learn the most. You're going to get the, the feedback that you want quicker and you're going to be able to change things quicker as a result as well. So just go and do it, you know, stop procrastinating, stop thinking about stuff too much and um, get on with it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was definitely part of that crew, you know, reading every business book I could find. And, and they're good for certain things. But at the end of the day, it's like you have to get out there in the real world. And a lot of business books, when you think when you start reading like over 100 of them or 200 of them, like like I've done you realize that a lot of them are saying the same things as well <laughs> and in just in different ways. And a lot of them are also written in terms of like peacetime, like as if you have all the time in the world to just work on things. But the reality of running a business is that you have your hands full pretty much all the time. And it's about solving issues and trying to get to, you know, future project and, and things like that. So it's impossible to learn that from a book and you have to, you really have to get out in the real world <laughs> faster rather than later. Yeah, absolutely, Ben. So just my last question for you. Well, actually before that, uh, if people want to sort of get a hold of you, if they want to buy some of your shoes, um, what's, what's the best sort of way for them to do that? Well, to get a hold of me, the best thing is to uh, follow me on Twitter and send me a message if you want. I try to respond to the majority of them. Of course, like when things go a little bit viral and get too many dms to be able to to uh, respond to everyone but uh try and uh yeah for if you want to check out the shoes it's just um widefootwear.com we ship to pretty much all around the world except for a few nations but yeah have happy customers all over and what are you most excited about when it comes to the future i'm excited about getting this message out to more people and i'm excited about um really just upping the game and um, um, having also getting more healthy competition. I, I think that's important. And I think, yeah, I mean, I, <clears throat> I'm really excited for the coming projects that we have. I can't say too much about them now, but it, it's, um, it's going to, we're going to take it to, an, to another level for sure. And um, I really pumped to get those out there. And uh yeah, and just everything that we have going on. Hopefully, we're going to make another study one day in a different part of the world. Um, looking at maybe doing one in Japan, something like that would be cool. Um, and yeah, just uh, just uh, hammering down on the mission for sure. Every day is bad. And my final question is: uh, What does being ridiculously human mean to you? For me, I mean, uh, what that means to me is um, being authentic. So when I I realized when uh, when I was kind of going from boy to man that I had a lot of, um, a lot of um, idols that I was looking up to and inspiration. And I realized that the like, common denominator of all of them was they were very authentic. They're saying what they were thinking. They were acting in a way that they didn't think about it too much. And they were being themselves. And I think uh, that's a very cool way to live, to just be authentic, be real, um, pretty much opposite of what we said about those influencers in, in the beginning of the show. Be real and uh, say what you think, stand for what you believe in and uh, have a clear mission. And that's what really sort of like attracted me to you. You know, I could feel, I was like, yeah, this guy is, he's authentic. You know, he, he's telling his truth. He's not hiding behind anything. He's happy to say what he thinks. And uh, I think like that's, a, that's an important thing, you know, like people, people appreciate the, the genuineness of, you know, and it, it allows them to find you easier you know like uh, it allows you to find you know to get your tribe easier and i think it's such a such a like it, it, it sounds like such a stupid thing to say but like just be yourself <laughs> we've come we've got into this world where it's like people are like faking it and they trying to pretend they're somebody they're not and it's like what are you doing like just be yourself because people will like you for who you are not for who you think you you know you want they want you to be sort of thing like it's just uh yeah i mean it's just it even sounds stupid to say it and also to be okay with that not everybody will like you because nobody is liked by all and if you are liked by all you're doing something wrong because you're not definitely not saying what you're thinking all the time so uh yeah i mean for me it's uh definitely liberating as well to just <laughs> to just say what you think and uh be able to stand for what you believe in so um i would love for more people to do that all the time. Well, but I just wanted to quickly say, uh, you know, thanks so much for, for coming on the show. Uh, I think, yeah, what you're doing is amazing. 
I'm just like, as you're talking, I'm like thinking, wow, couldn't this industry, you know, like benefit from your shoes or, you know, kids or whatever it is. And like, I'm super happy that there's guys like you and your brother, I think you in the business with that, um, you're you're doing things like this and you're giving people uh, alternatives, uh, you giving people, you know, hope and uh, for the, for the future in terms of their own health. And uh, yeah, it's just been super interesting chatting to you, man. And um, I really enjoy following you online. Like I really encourage other people to as well. And, you know, thank you. Thanks again for your time. And I'm just really looking forward to seeing what you, what you sort of, you know, put out there and, and your, your new designs and everything in the future. Yeah. I appreciate that. Appreciate for you for having me on as well. And um, should do it again sometime in the future. Cool. Thanks, bud. Yeah, thank you.